Summary of The Nurture Assumption Why Children Turn Out the Way They Do By Judith Rich Harris Nature and Nurture For a long time, experts have considered heredity and environment, or nature and nurture, to be the two factors most responsible for how children develop. However, while heredity is indeed important, nurture is very overrated. No credible scientific evidence supports the notion that how parents treat their children matters more than tangentially in how the children develop. Researchers use the word socialization to describe how children become members of the society in which they live. Although babies are not exactly blank slates, they do, after all, have a certain genetic endowment, they must learn a great deal to become socially adept. For example, they must learn a language, that means learning to speak as a native, without a foreign accent. Children must learn how to talk, walk, sit, stand, how to behave and how to dress, all of which differ from culture to culture and group to group. The nurture assumption says that parents teach their children these lessons and many others that determine whether the children become well socialized. However, little evidence supports this assumption and a lot of evidence indicates that children's socialization depends more on their genetics and their peer groups than on their parents. Socialization research on this issue offers an astonishing display of rash judgment and poor science. Most studies on the impact that parents and parenting styles have on socialization fail to control for genetic influences. Therefore, while it may be true that well-socialized, well-adjusted, competent parents have children who tend to resemble them, much of the resemblance may be due to genetics. These effects are not always direct and straightforward. Genes, for example, affect physical appearance. Research has established that parents tend to favor cute children more than children who are not cute. Thus, two children may have the same parents, but if one is beautiful and the other is unattractive, they will have different upbringings. Socialization research does nothing to control for this phenomenon. Moreover, genetics can affect how children behave and what choices they make. Research on identical twins has found that even when they are raised in separate homes, far from each other, they often have very similar personalities and make very similar choices about what they wear, what cars they drive, what careers they pursue, how they behave and so forth. Without controlling for the effect of genetics, something few socialization researchers have done. Making any reliable conclusions about the effect of nurture on child development is extremely difficult. Fashions in child rearing Child rearing fashions seem to change almost as frequently and for as little reason as clothing fashions. In fact, people adopt child raising practices for the same reason they adopt other practices, they tend to do what others in their group are doing. Breastfeeding is popular now among the reasonably prosperous, well educated mothers in the US white middle class but it is not especially fashionable among their African-American peers. In some developing countries, influential peer groups approve bottle feeding as the fashion even though it is not as good for babies as breastfeeding. Among the white, well-educated U.S. middle class, spanking or swatting children is unfashionable. Among other U.S. ethnic groups, peer group norms approve spanking. Child-rearing fashions have varied. Over time, experts have advised parents both to be somewhat remote and unemotional and, in contrast, to lavish affection upon their children. Current thinking emphasizes raising children in solid, two-parent families, but it once advised sending even very young children away to boarding schools. At one time or another, child-rearing styles seem to have encompassed every possible set of contradictory approaches. In America, especially amid upper-middle-class whites, the fashion is to do what experts say. Why? Because the relevant peer group defines that as right or normal. The importance of the group. Humans, like chimpanzees, are social animals. Humans and chimps resemble each other closely. Genetically, the two species are quite similar and they share certain social characteristics. For example, chimpanzees distinguish between members of their own groups and members of other groups. They make war on other groups, sometimes planning the engagements in advance, and using stealth and guile. Anthropologist Jane Goodall witnessed a group of chimps massacre a smaller group, which had originally been part of the larger group. Indeed, Goodall reported that chimps tended to be more violent toward those with whom they were acquainted. 
In another case, when a crippled chimp tried to rejoin his group, they attacked and attempted to kill him. Group membership seems to be deeply rooted in humanity's evolutionary heritage. Research indicates that people are disposed to form groups quickly and to identify with them. In fact, people do not even have to be acquainted with the other members of a group to manifest a group preference. In one experiment, people were told about two groups and then informed at random that they belonged to one or the other. Then, researchers gave them the opportunity to distribute rewards between the two groups. Even though their allocation decisions would not affect the rewards they themselves were going to get, people tended to favor the group to which they had been told they belong. A study conducted in the mid-1950s at the Robbers Cave State Park in Oklahoma found that hostility and violence erupt very quickly when boys form groups. Babies recognize and begin to imitate each other at a very young age. They sort themselves into a group whose salient characteristic is their mutual babyhood. Groups defined by age e children and adults, for example e are common in most societies, even hunter-gatherer villages. By enabling more people to live in a given area, agriculture seems to have made it possible for people to form groups defined by age and gender, girls and boys, women and men. Groups establish criteria for membership. Individuals may decide whether they belong to a group based on how much they resemble its members. Interestingly, a group you don't belong to, in fact, a group that rejects you, can also socialize you. A couple, both American hippies, left their six-year-old son at a Tibetan monastery to live with numerous Tibetan boys who were training to become Buddhist monks. Although the Tibetans did not really accept the tall white boy as one of their peers, he was socialized as a Tibetan. Years later, living in the U.S. with his Tibetan wife, he referred to himself as a Tibetan in the body of an American. How Groups Raise Children The goal of a child is not adult success, but rather childhood success. Status in a peer group is a linchpin factor in that success. Children do not seek to emulate their parents, instead, they want to be like their peers. This is why children consider the prospect of being held back in school as frightening. They lose membership in the group they know and must take the status of being misfits in a group they do not know. Group forces may be responsible for the failure of certain programs intended to combat juvenile crime or to improve educational outcomes. It isn't unusual, for example, for African-American boys to consider academic success as UN African-American, or even to scorn two studious peers for acting white. Research shows that children are more likely to smoke if their friends smoke, but whether their parents smoke makes little difference. Some teen peer groups value criminal behavior, toughness and a willingness to take risks. Recidivism is particularly high among juvenile delinquents who are sent to programs where they live with other youthful offenders. This is to be expected, given the power of group norms. Small wonder, then, that the neighborhood where a child grows up can have a powerful determining influence on how it develops. A Danish study found that children adopted by criminals were only likely to become criminals themselves. Under one circumstance, growing up in a high-crime neighborhood. To influence behavior and development, social programs should address groups rather than individual children or their parents. Groups transmit language, culture, and values to children. It is noteworthy that historically black colleges produce the majority of prominent black intellectuals, and that girls seem to do better in science and math in all girl schools than in co-ed schools. In a school with an all-black or all-female population, academic achievement is not defined as non-black or unfeminine. Group norms do not discourage excellence. How to raise children. Clearly, parents have a limited ability to influence children's development. Socialization researchers have not demonstrated that such factors as birth order, spanking or parental education are responsible for how children develop. Genes and environment matter. However, in the long run, it is not the parental environment, but the peer group environment that really counts. Therefore, parents should be aware of their limitations and their potential. One potential asset is the possibility that a family can become a group. Although it seems rare in the West, a parent can become a group leader, shaping the group's goals and values, and setting its boundaries. It is probably necessary for families to include a minimum number of members in order to become a group, but it's not clear what that number is. 
parents can affect the development of children most directly through the influence they exercise over establishing a child's peer group. Parents pick the neighborhood where the family will live and often choose their children's schools. All things considered, it is obviously better to select a neighborhood and a school where peer pressures are likelier to push your child in a good direction. Seek a school where students consider academic achievement desirable and admirable, and where members of the child's ethnic group do not value academic failure. If possible, choose a vicinity where juvenile crime is rare or non-existent. Of course, almost every neighborhood has its share of delinquency, and kids who are bent on defining themselves as delinquents will somehow manage to find peers. However, degrees of delinquency differ from neighborhood to neighborhood, so it is important to recognize that choosing a neighborhood is a decisive step toward choosing a peer group. Parents can help children do better within their groups, and this is crucial. Selecting a child's name can be key. Parents who pick bizarre names can sentence children to ridicule and perhaps even victimization. If your child has skin problems, go to a dermatologist. If the child has crooked teeth, get them straightened. If the child has an obesity problem, address it. Group status matters deeply to children, and their self-esteem grows from group acceptance. Of course, group status also matters to adults. Many child-rearing and child-development fashions have spread only because groups define them as desirable. In the natural order of things, dominance happens. Parents are supposed to be the dominant members of families. They aren't entertainers or playmates. Their job is to be in charge. In many societies, older siblings also have a dominant and caretaking role. Consider that the arrival of a young brother or sister displaces the older sibling as a center of attention. The middle-class American insistence on treating children equally means that the older sibling does not receive the perquisite that could soften the blow of this displacement, a degree of authority and responsibility. Sibling rivalry does not seem to happen in societies that allow older siblings to take their rightful place as bosses of younger siblings. Indeed, children tend to develop close alliances in such societies. Brotherhood and sisterhood really mean something. The nurture assumption has been responsible for plenty of parental anxiety and distress. When children turn out badly, the nurture assumption says that it is the parent's fault. But no evidence supports the nurture assumption. It's a myth. So, parents should stop worrying and do the best job they can. However, this job includes recognizing their limits and acknowledging the power and importance of peer groups. Children live and learn in groups. They adopt group norms. They try hard to be good members of their groups, to achieve status and recognition by the group's standards. They learn, through the group, to be members of society. So, the most important contribution that parents can make to a child's development may very well be the influence they wield in making certain groups available e or unavailable e for the child to join.